My advice to Democratic legislators is get addicted to victory. You know that yeah. feeling you had that when you were like, we're helping hundreds of millions of people. Everyone's going to love us. People are going to get those $1,400 checks. People are going to get this child tax credit. Like we're going to be heroes. Just get addicted to that. Just be like, yeah, that yeah. was not I, enough. Yeah, I, I, write, I write a newsletter once a week and uh, this was writing about this exact topic. And I, I compared the advice I had for them to the advice that you get from like the worst baseball coach in little league who like watches you hit a home run and it's just like, do that again, do that again. Like do that again. That, that is useless in baseball. <laughs> but, but I think, I, I, I think, you know, legislating is actually a very complicated thing, but it, given the limitations that Democrats have, they have 50 votes. Everyone needs to be on board. So everyone's potentially a kingmaker. Anyone could spoil this thing. So basically, everyone has to agree not to do that. Once you get that kind of consensus that we have to just move, uh, then I think it's possible. And it's not a model of legislating that I think you'll see repeated a lot in history if they do it. But I think it's, you know, it is possible because what you say, like the, the rescue plan was a huge win. Uh, they feel good about it. So why not repeat the process? All right, welcome back to Yang Speaks. On today's episode, we've got the editor-in-chief of Crooked Media, Brian Boitler, joins for a conversation with Andrew. They talk politics on a national scale, which we haven't done in a while. Brian is actually doing a ton of coverage on the first 100 days of the Biden administration. So it's a fascinating conversation between Brian and Andrew. You're going to enjoy it. Tune in now. It is a pleasure to welcome to the podcast, the editor-in-chief of Crooked Media and the host of the new podcast, Rubicon, about the first 100 days of the Biden administration, which are passing very quick. You might need to do the second 100 days in just a minute. Brian <laughs> Boitler, welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me. I, you know, there are a lot of reasons I like you. Uh, but one reason I like you is that you have, I think, a physics and astronomy degree from UC Berkeley, which strikes me as such like unusual <laughs> background for like a political voice. Uh, and, and also my dad has a physics degree from Berkeley. So that's one oh, reason I liked you. I think it was helpful to like I moved to Washington to do journalism kind of from the the hometown I grew up in, which was in the middle of nowhere in California. And so I didn't, I worried that I wouldn't have any way to distinguish myself. I didn't have any like networks to tap into to break into journalism, which a lot of young journalists do have. Uh, but the fact that I was coming from a physics and astronomy background actually worked to my advantage because most of the young journalists trying to break in were poli sci majors or whatever. And, uh, and so it was a rarity and that, and that helped. But the, the problem is that it, it stuck and I've been doing it for 16 years now and I've forgotten almost everything I learned in college. Oh, don't worry about it, man. <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm sure that basics would come back to you if you were stuck on a desert island and had to, <laughs> you know, like uh, make something happen. Um, so you grew up in, in a small town in California and when you showed up to Berkeley, it must have been a bit of an, an adjustment. And I say this because my parents met at Berkeley. My brother is named after the Lawrence Observatory and then he went to Berkeley and then I spent some time at Berkeley with him. Uh, it's a it's an incredible environment. It's got a reputation as a real hotbed of political activism. Uh, did it activate you in some way or were you activated before you got there? Looking back, there definitely was some element of culture shock coming from the Inland Empire, Redlands, California to Berkeley. But part of what made it an easier adjustment is that the Bay Area in general and Berkeley in, in particular have this reputation everywhere, but particularly in California, of being just completely off the wall crazy, right? And so when you actually get there and it's a little weird here and there, like different in, in some ways, but not so much different than regular life, uh, it uh, I feel like the, the outsized expectations for how out there the place is made it easier for me to adjust. Disappointing. Coming from you were like, yeah. what? Just college kids doing normal college kid stuff? 
Um, but there was, you know, in Redlands, there was no radical politics. There's an awful lot of radical politics in Berkeley. Um, and I was there when 9-11 happened. I was a sophomore. Um, and then, so obviously I was still there when the war in Afghanistan started and the war in Iraq started. And Berkeley was a hub for a lot of anti-war activity. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure what kind of person or intellect I'd be today if I hadn't been in the Bay Area at Berkeley for that formative experience because it was a moment where I feel like the culture and politics were pulling people in one direction or another to be skeptical of what the government was doing or to just be extremely jingoistic about it. And so I think I, I uh, it, it, it pulled me in, in what I, in retrospect, think of was the right direction. Well, I, I mean, I agree with the direction it, it pulled you in, that's for sure. You went to D.C., you reported for a bunch of different publications and were kind of in the orbit of Crooked Media before they managed to wrangle you. <laughs> Is that about right? That's um, about right. And, I, and, I've, and I've been to the Crooked Media studios uh, in, in L.A. I've interacted with a lot of your colleagues. I, it, I love Crooked Media. You all are like the next generation voice of politics. So many people get their information from you. I feel like you're edifying uh, the next generation uh, and really shaping the political culture in a profound way. So to the extent that they did get you, I mean, I, I feel like it's it's an incredible org. And I feel like being editor in chief is frankly a massive responsibility. No, no pressure, anything, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the uh, shows we produce don't really benefit from my Midas touch or anything like that. But, you know, it's no it's not a coincidence that after after getting my first internship and then my first job, I didn't at any point move into a big media company. Um, I've always worked at smaller independent media companies and I anticipate that I'll continue to do that uh, for the reasons you say. It's it's easier to innovate. It's also, I think, in a lot of ways easier to be honest about what you're seeing in the world. And uh, there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, in journalism, like a lot of people, not in all of journalism, but in po political journalism specifically, where the, you know, the um, ideal, the beau ideal of journalism is that you see what's happening and you tell your readers or whoever the, the truth about what you're seeing. And in political journalism, there's so many compromises you have to make to operate within the system that particularly at big media companies, you aren't always conveying to your audience exactly what it is you know. Wow. Wait, this is so deep. Tell us more, Brian. Tell us more. I mean, well, <laughs> I, I, it's hard. It's, it's very hard. It's easy to generalize. It's much... I think better to talk about specific things and maybe we can get into it with respect to, to Biden. But you know, the, the, you, you'll hear these terms if you, if you dwell in the, in the world of media criticism a lot, you know, both sides or he said, she said, uh, those are artifacts of having to, uh, retain sources and, uh, access to both political parties and, uh, when the, you know, when the relationship is built on those terms, uh, it's very hard to break out of that box and say when the two parties have gone in very different directions, right? Um, and so I feel like that basic dynamic uh, infects a lot of marquee journalism. And I don't think I would succeed in that environment. And so I've sort of steered clear from it. Wow. I love it. Uh, you know, that, 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 I mean, that, that simple commentary explains a lot of people's frustrations, frankly. <laughs> with, I think so. With, with, with like a lot of political journalism. And, and I, I do genuinely think that Crooked Media does a better job of having a point of view and just calling it like you see it. Uh, in part, probably because you're a little bit less entrenched. You know what I mean? Like, uh, mm -hmm. I think people kind of expect you all to have uh, individual voices and, and points of view. Uh, and I think that's why people love you, honestly. I think that's why people are attracted um, to, to to your materials. You know, I think if if the if the company or people at the company ever decided they wanted to turn it into something more like Fox News, where it was just propaganda for Democrats, it would not be a fun place to work. But the what I think what cements the bond with the audience and what makes it a good place to work are that you know I th there's no uh, doubt I think in anyone's mind who listens. Which party the the <laughs> hosts of Pod Save America think is the better of the two parties? Which you know what views they think are the uh, you know better views? Uh, but you, like, there's no hiding or erasing bad news stories for Democrats, and there's no making up lies about uh, Republicans or conservatives. So there's a slant, but it's 
it's true and people who listen to it will be better informed. Whereas I think ideological media on the right is not does not work that way. It's not constrained uh, by reality. <laughs> right. And, and so and so and so people who are immersed who only get their news from say Fox News or even now Newsmax or OANN, they come away believing things that are false. Uh and that's just not going to happen to people who listen to our shows or read our website or subscribe to our newsletters or anything like that. I finally started going to the gym again, feeling pretty good about it. And I just went and I used my new pair of Raycon wireless earbuds when I went and they were awesome. It's like they're built for me to move around in, which is cool. There's no wires or stems or things like that to get in your way. They come in a range of different colors. Um, mine's blue, which is awesome. And they're built to perform anywhere at any time. So they're water and sweat resistant, which I liked. And the Bluetooth pairs super quickly with my phone. So whether you're listening to a podcast like this one or binging an audiobook or going through a workout like I'm talking about, Raycom is awesome. Their battery life's up to six hours and Frankly, it's accessible. Like the wireless earbuds are starting at half the price of other premium audio brands, which is cool. So right now, Raycon is offering 15% off all their products for our listeners. And here's what you gotta do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash yang. That's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. So feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off buy, B-U-Y, Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N, dot com slash yang. Buyraycon.com slash yang. Check them out. So you just said, hey, people know that if we um, have a choice between these two parties, we're much more uh, in line with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, which I happen to be as well. And I think a lot of people agree with that. Um, but there are some folks who get frustrated with the Democratic Party from time to time. And I, I had a conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> with one one person who I'm just going to throw out there because she came to my head was uh, Brianna Joy Gray, who said, mm -hmm. like, hey, the Democratic Party, you know, like kind of frustrating sometimes. Um, but we we are in such this bifurcated two party system, uh, and the last number of years we've just been trying to get Trump out and then trying to you know like keep things together. <laughs> um, so is, is there a point of view either either of you individually or the folks you work with around the problem of polarization that uh, Ezra Klein and others have written about um, the two party system, like whether there's a need to evolve, which is one of the things that. Uh, Brianna was arguing for. And Brianna's arguing for it from one point of view. There are disaffected Republicans who are arguing from another point of view. There are like other people that have. So like, uh, do you either individually or institutionally have any point of view on whether this two-party system is working? So I, I think it's sort of built into the DNA of the country at this point, which is the source of a lot of frustration for progressives, people further to the left. I think that the Democratic Party is like the le like left wing coalition you would see in a parliamentary system except instead of it being a coalition of multiple parties it's one party and everyone has to kind of make it work you know whichever faction is disempowered and for years that's been the left uh it does feel like we need a third party because our views are just not really even on the table when it comes time to govern um, I think that's less true under Biden than it was under Obama, and it's you know moving in a more genial direction. The the polarization question I kind of view a little differently. When I hear polarization, I think you have two parties. They once upon a time were similar, and then they kind of moved away from each other. And for someone who wants to dig into that history, uh, Ezra Klein's book Why We're Polarized talks about just how similar the two parties were a number of decades ago, and then they 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 like which is. Um, something that I frankly did not realize until I read that book, um, that because you think about Democrats and Republicans as standing for different things. And there was a period when they were really very, very similar. <laughs> you know, my, my grandfather was like an Eisenhower Republican, but by the time he died, he was a, like an Obama Democrat. And really, that's just the same thing. I think that that kind of illustrates the point you're making in, in the, yeah, yeah, totally. in the person of my grandfather. But that's what I think of when somebody says polarization. The two parties moved away from each other. 
And I think that that's very imprecise. And a lot of, I think, experts, political scientists agree, and they coined a new term, asymmetric polarization, to convey the fact that the Republicans have raced right much faster than the Democrats have raced left. I still find that a fairly unsatisfying description of what happened in American politics, because it it never the, like it nevertheless suggests that at some DNA like level, the two parties share certain precepts about how you how you govern a country, like what what the country even means. And I think at some point along the way, past the the Gingrich era. The Republican Party kind of speciated into something else where uh, they didn't have like a, a illiberal right wing fringe that existed in coalition with uh, small L liberals who just wanted lower taxes, more markets, et cetera. They have given – like yielded to the illiberal right wing and so now you have a party that rejects uh, fundamental precepts of self-governance. You're right that polarized – is an oversimplification kind of both sidesism in itself. And what happened to the Republican Party is just like a, a very different thing. And I, I totally agree with you. And I think that what happens is that as it as it becomes the hub for people, voters, elites who um, don't really believe in democratic elections, um, who don't believe in sort of like generally applicable, neutrally applicable law, you know, the law should be our friend and, uh, and that, you know, a, a, like a tool to punish our enemies that you, you get some sluffage of the, of the remnant, you know, anti, we call them anti-Trump Republicans or never Trump Republicans. And some of them join the democratic party and it makes the democratic coalition ever more unwieldy, but, it, <laughs> but, but I, but I think it also, I think it also probably slows the democratic parties creep to the left in that it has to be the party that contains the small D Democrats of society. So that's why it contains Bernie Sanders and Joe Manchin and the never Trumpers. And somehow it has to work. Um, the, it's hard for a party that constituted in that way to really dart in one ideological direction or another. Wow. I, I loved that uh, explanation, Brian. Talking to you is a lot of fun. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Now, I suppose we're going to get into the meat of this thing, which is how's the Biden administration going? <laughs> I know you unpack this uh, on the podcast, uh, which we recommend Rubicon uh, about the first hundred days uh, of the Biden administration. So you've been watching this more closely than just about anyone. I have been pleased with the Biden administration from my vantage point. Mm -hmm. I thought that the American uh, Rescue Act or Plan Act, I guess it was a plan and then became an act. <laughs> yeah, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act. <laughs> oh, thank you for, for <laughs> distinguishing. Uh, I loved it. You know, I'm part of the, I think, you know, 72% of Americans or so who, who loved it. Uh, I love that they're trying to define infrastructure broadly, <laughs> do a lot of big things. Uh, the fact that it was uh, so narrowly won, uh, I think zero Republicans, certainly zero Republicans in the Senate voted for it. I think maybe zero in the House as well. And that uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan Act uh, needed Kamala to come and uh, be the deciding vote. And then they looked up and said, wow, we just passed a $1.9 trillion act uh, with not a single Republican vote. It's like, what else can we do? <laughs> They're looking around being like, oh, like this infrastructure plan could look really good. But then it goes to uh, then it goes to what you just described, which is that Democrats have a lot of different people, a lot of different uh, perspectives. And now you can't lose a single vote. So, <laughs> so you're looking around saying, like, can we get this done? Uh, is, was, is that an apt description? I think so. I think I agree with basically everything you said. You know, when we were planning the show, uh, we didn't know if Democrats were going to control Congress, if they were going to have the Senate. Thank you again, Georgia. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Reverend Warnock, John Ossoff. All right, continue. The difference between a first 100 days show where Congress is divided and a first 100 days show where Democrats have unified control of government uh, is night and day. There'd be, be more dramatic tension in the show if Democrats hadn't won the Senate, which is not to say it's oh too my bad gosh. that they won. I, I occasionally, so I spent weeks campaigning in Georgia and the picture I painted all the time, Brian, was do we really want Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer 
just aiming the car at a ditch <laughs> like for, 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 for another four years. Like, do you really all think that's going to be a good move? And, and, you know, anyone who talks about bipartisanship, it's like it really just boils down to Mitch McConnell yep. uh, driving driving the car into a ditch. So I completely agree with you that if you were to plan this first 100 days of the Biden administration, it would have been incredibly fraught and dramatic oh, yeah. in, in a world where Mitch had to say yes to things. Well, if if you think he would have had to say yes to things. The way we were kind of anticipating things if Georgia went sideways was, you know, maybe Democrats would get one more small COVID relief bill. It wouldn't be uh, big enough to, you know, do uh, what I think needs to be done to fix the country, but it would help. And then that would be sort of the end of legislating, uh, or at least big deal legislating. Biden would probably have to be more aggressive with his executive power. Um, Democrats in Congress probably would have felt more pressure to do uh, more in the realm of Trump accountability, use their subpoena power to finally get some answers to the questions that he stonewalled them on for the, for the last four years. Um, and we would have had to evaluate Biden's first 100 days on a whole different set of terms. And it would have been harder for him to lay the groundwork for a successful presidency in an environment where he was unable to pass a bill large enough to hopefully get the economy stabilized. Um, when they won Georgia, it it changed. And so suddenly his potential, you know, for greatness or whatever you want to call it, rose. Um, and which meant in some ways the stakes were higher. Like we, we would have all noticed if the American Rescue Plan had failed or if he had had to dramatically cut it down uh, to get 50 votes for it. Um, and one of the, I think, a, a fair metric for success is that he introduced this $1.9 trillion plan uh, and it passed almost completely unchanged from how he asked Congress to pass it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, now, unlike in 2009, where you had a lot of economists warning, this Stimulus bill isn't going to be big enough for how big a hole we need to fill. Now it's, you know, almost universal. This is the right size bill. And maybe you have like some dissenters saying it might even be a little too big and we might have to contend with some inflation. Like that's a night and day difference between how the last Democratic trifecta dealt with a crisis and how this one did. I, I think it's the right size. <laughs> Seems right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's, as a matter of fact, when I drew it up, I said, Joe, 1.9 trillion would be just about right. <laughs> So, have you ever browsed in incognito mode? I used to use it when I was buying flights, trying to make sure they weren't jacking up the price as I kept looking at something. But it is not as incognito as you think. Incognito does not mean invisible. And a lot of these browsers have a form of like private C mode. And they don't really work that well. So how do you actually make yourself invisible? Express VPN. So it turns out that even in incognito mode, your online activity still gets tracked and data brokers can still buy and sell your data. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location. But with ExpressVPN, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is matched. So every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address. It's custom to you. It's only shared within the ExpressVPN customer network. It makes it harder for third parties to identify and harvest your data. And best of all, it's super easy to use. Even I can use it and I'm kind of tech illiterate at times. So here's the deal. If you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang and get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Yang, ExpressVPN dot com slash Yang. I ran into Chuck Schumer today um, in Brooklyn, and he had on a mask that said cancel student debt, which I appreciated a great deal from the mm -hmm. majority leader. Uh, I know there's been some discussion as to whether Joe has the ability to cancel student debt via executive order, and then some people have gone back and forth. I'm going to go on the record and say, if I were president, I would certainly be testing my ability to do that. <laughs> That's like, let's see if we can do it. Um, do you have a point of view both on uh, the ability to cancel student debt and then the wisdom of doing so? It's it's hard to say. Like I, I, I listen to lawyers who know the, this area of the law really well, and they make very persuasive arguments. And in a world where I thought the way things worked was that if you had sound legal arguments for something, you got to do it. Um, 
you know, I'd say, yes, he absolutely can do it. And it's just a matter of making sure that he follows the Administrative Procedures Act or whatever he has to do to uh, to make it lawful uh, when when done. But in the world we actually live in, the question of whether he can do it or not is going to be answered perhaps by uh, a very skewed Supreme Court. And I have no idea what they're going to say. Um, oh, uh, no. Oh, no. This uh, new Supreme Court. Because the court is not like a natural ally of the Biden administration – uh, what do you do about that? Well, one argument is you got to move fast because you're very likely to run into legal issues with the Supreme Court and have to take a second bite at things or whatever. Uh, the, the the flip side of that is that if you move too fast and you don't dot all your I's and cross your T's, then the work you do might end up getting thrown out on some sort of legal technicality as opposed to the the substance of the law. So, I think that that probably explains part of why um, – you know, we're going to probably cross the 100-day threshold and and he won't have uh, forgiven any student debt. Um, but uh, there are other considerations too. Um, I think that, you know, in an environment where you have just passed a $2 trillion coronavirus relief bill and you want to pass another very large bill that won't be fully financed, um, if you're going to play footsie with, with inflation, maybe you want to see what happens with those before you write off another several hundred billion dollars in student debt. Um, and that may be part of the reason why they're not racing to do this. I think there's a, there's a, there's a third uh, issue to consider, which is if you're going to do something like that, which polls pretty well, will definitely make a lot of your own voters enthusiastic, likely to show up at the polls. Do you maybe want to try to do it closer to an election? Um, I think that all of those uh, factors are probably contributing to uh, the internal debate uh, uh, at the in the Biden administration over what to do, when to do it, how big to go. That's fascinating. You're right that it would be hundreds of billions of dollars if it was going to be significant at all. I think the level of education uh, debt out there right now is 1.6 trillion. Last I checked, I'm I'm operating from memory here, but I think that you know the the smaller relief. Uh, idea that that Biden has embraced at ten thousand dollars worth of student debt and and uh, phase out um, is somewhere in the three hundred billion dollar range, and the and the Schumer uh, Warren plan the uh, sort of fifty thousand dollars just forgive as much debt as you can is about a trillion, so it's a lot of money. Um, it's not if he it, it, it would have been a, a no brainer, I think in an environment where Mitch McConnell was running the Senate and had said no to the American Rescue Plan, well, then you need to get money out the door. And that's a that's a freebie. Um, just do it. Some students right now are wincing at this. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the thing is that, is that for all for all these, uh, any kind of stimulus, like the, the nice thing about the Rescue Plan is that it was very broad based. Like it's a few people, yeah. relatively speaking, myself, Yourself, perhaps, who got like no, have gotten no COVID relief over the last year, uh, were like in the small minority of people who don't qualify. And basically, everyone else gets a stimulus check. Many people get, um, get unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. The student loan, uh, plan is comparably much more targeted. And so, when when you stop talking about aggregates, the huge sums of money being distributed broadly and start talking about individual programs and you say, well, because we did this one thing, now maybe we have to take a pause on the other thing. Well, then the constituency that would benefit from that is like, well, I, I was told that I was going to get my student loan forgiven. When, when's that going to happen? But, you know, a promise is a promise. I expect it's coming. I don't think he's going to renege. Well, that that's great news uh, to a lot of people. And one of the things I did suggest, which the American Rescue Plan Act does address in, in large part, is that you, you want to get money out very broadly. Like you don't want to pick a certain segment of the population uh, and say, we're going to help you and not necessarily uh, get help to others. All right, let's face it, guys. Taking trips to the post office is probably not how you want to spend your time. And that's why we recommend mailing and shipping online at stamps.com. Stamps.com allows you to mail and ship anytime, anywhere, right from your computer. Send letters, ship packages, and pay a lot less with discounted rates from USPS, UPS, and more. And stamps.com has saved businesses thousands of hours and tons of money. So with stamps.com, you get the services of the post office and UPS 
all in one place. I love it because I always forget to either buy stamps or don't even think about it. And then I'm like, oh crap, what do I need to do? Go to stamps.com, bang, it's right there. Super simple, easy. You can do it from anywhere you are because we travel a lot and ship stuff extremely conveniently. So here's the deal. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with our promo code YANG, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in YANG. That's stamps.com, promo code YANG, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. So what is your prognosis for the infrastructure bill? What are we looking at, uh, Brian? Uh, you know, because like, there's so many people that want a lot of things in there. And let me also say on the record, I love it all. Like just about everything I've seen, I'm like, sure, throw it in there. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so what what are you seeing and hearing in terms of, um, like, like, it could be at this point, individual legislators and like their pet issues, like what they will and won't accept uh, the all the ultimate size of the bill. I've seen something in like the two trillion dollar range. I, I believe uh, is this also going to be a bill that gets no Republicans? I get the sense that it probably will be from <laughs> what I'm hearing. Look, in a world where uh, the filibuster were to be abolished or reformed, if Democrats were to do that before reaching. Uh, the jobs plan. You could you could imagine a world where you you break that bill up into different pieces, and some Republicans, maybe a handful of them, support this piece, but not that piece. But mostly Democrats pass the whole thing in piecemeal. Um, but because the rules of the Senate are what they are, and it seems like the question whether they're going to abolish or reform the filibuster is now kind of in doubt. You have to do it as one giant package and put it through the budget process so that you can circumvent the filibuster. So that makes it hard. You have to hold all 50 senators together, all like make sure that nobody's uh, Im- like ideas that they care deeply about are I- omitted. Also not add ideas that are viewed as sort of poison pills to uh, you know, Joe Manchin on the one end or Bernie Sanders on the other. Um, you have to uh, find a, a method of paying for it that isn't, pay, you know, raising taxes too aggressively or, or or too or not paying for enough of it. And, and not because there's necessarily a right answer to that question, but because you need all 50 uh, members to agree. And that's a, a hard thing to do. Part of me thinks it's sort of like, too big to fail in some sense. Like I don't think Democrats want to go into the midterms having dealt Joe Biden a very big defeat because he's basically said this is what we need to do, and uh, like he's put his whole administration behind it. And um, you know that gives me uh, like some hope that that it'll pass. But for that to happen, I think Democrats have to embrace that feeling, this, the sort of psychology that they had after the rescue plan passed, right, where they didn't let their uh, peccadilloes uh, eat away at the bill until it fell apart or got, you know, became too small. There wasn't a lot of rancor. That bill passed and everyone was happy and everyone thought they did a good thing. Um, And uh, everyone felt proud. If they can kind of repeat that process where they say, you know, there'll be a time to fight for my pet project on future bills. But for this bill, what we need to do is limit the amount of rancor in within our own ranks. Um, and we also uh, we also need to move quickly. And uh, and we, we need to, you know, satisfy ourselves with m- very small trims around the edges as opposed to big changes. Um, then they can just do it and it'll pass. They'll feel good about it again. Uh, and then they can uh, resume squabbling over, you know, uh, <laughs> The more trivial issues that divide them. Um, the risk is that you know there's no there's no deadline to pass this bill. There's no this this bill will seemingly have a tax component. So it's just harder to get that kind of agreement to get people to agree to set aside their uh, their priorities and just trust that Joe Biden's plan is the is the right plan. Um, and I think it sort of remains to be seen whether they can do that. It'll be a big feat if they do, and uh, it'll be a, a big legacy. A piece for Biden, but also for Chuck Schumer in a way. My advice to Democratic legislators is get addicted to victory. You know that yeah. feeling you had that when you were like, we're helping hundreds of millions of people. Everyone's going to love us. People are going to get those $1,400 checks. People are going to get this 
child tax credit. Like we're going to be heroes. Just get addicted to that. Just be like, yeah, that yeah, was I, not enough. Yeah, I, I, write, I write a newsletter once a week and uh, this was writing about this exact topic. And I, I compared the advice I had for them to the advice that you get from like the worst baseball coach in little league who like watches you hit a home run and it's just like, do that again, do that again. Like do that again. That, that is useless in baseball. <laughs> but, but I think, I, I, I think, you know, legislating is actually a very complicated thing, but it, given the limitations that Democrats have, they have 50 votes. Everyone needs to be on board. So everyone's potentially a kingmaker. Anyone could spoil this thing. So basically, everyone has to agree not to do that. Once you get that kind of consensus that we have to just move, uh, then I think it's possible. And it's not a model of legislating that I think you'll see repeated a lot in history if they do it. Um, you know, <laughs> legislation tends to the acrimonious. But um, – uh, but I think it's, you know, it is possible because what you say, like the, the rescue plan was a huge win. Uh, they feel good about it. So why not repeat the process? I find myself cautiously optimistic somehow because we do, we need to do a lot more. Uh, and the Biden administration, frankly, rests on being able to get a significant infrastructure bill passed. Uh, when I spoke to Joe not that long ago, he literally said to me, we need to rebuild the country. And this is the, 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 the bill to do that. He meant literally, too. It's like we literally need to rebuild the country. All right, if you're like me, when you have a bad night's sleep, you remember it. Like I can remember three or four, maybe my top 10, even like worst night sleeps because it just kills you. And like either up all night or you wake up with a massive backache. And I'm proud to say that I'm a massive supporter of Helix Sleep because they give me great night's sleep. I have the King Lux mattress. It's massive, it's comfortable, it is perfect. Oh, I'm a huge, huge Helix fan. So you go online, you take a two minute quiz, you match a mattress with your body type. With your hot sleeper, you're like a firm mattress, like soft mattress, doesn't matter. You figure out what your custom preferences are. You get matched with the mattress, they ship it to you in a box, it pops out beautifully. No hassle, super easy. It was an overall mattress, top pick in 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So here's the deal. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a custom mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life for real. Helix is offering right now up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash yang. So that's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash yang for up to $200 off and two free pillows. So when you were describing this process just now, Brian, you were centering on the 50 senators, which I think I, I naturally do too. Uh, does that mean that you think that getting a really significant wide ranging bill through the House uh, on the Democratic side is less of an issue? Because their majority there is not massive either. I, I think they, they can lose maybe five or six votes uh, and and pass something without any Republicans. Um, your description was uh, about the 50 senators. Is, is that a greater issue to pass something really significant? Nancy Pelosi is a, a, a lion of the House for this reason. She's really, really, really good at passing big bills, particularly ones that are, that are complex, but needed for the the party to accomplish its goals, right? Like what she did in 2009 with the Affordable Care Act, even like the, um, what was it, the Waxman-Markey climate change bill that ultimately didn't even pass in the in the Senate. You know, she had a much bigger majority to work with then, but those were, uh, those were much harder issues than spending money on things people understand need to be financed, right? Um, elder care, new roads and bridges, et cetera. Like this is all popular, easy stuff. You're not... You're not like remaking the energy market. You're not remaking the healthcare market. So um, I I think that a the fact that she has wiggle room at all will help. Um, and b uh, the um, you know her skill in in wrangling together 218 votes for for big bills will just make that more doable. With with 50, it's uh, in in the Senate, it's just tougher. It, you know, there's when, when, the, when the margin for error is literally zero, it changes a lot of dynamics. Um, it also, I think, in some ways helps because, you know, 
everyone has an incentive to play along because they don't want to be the one that causes the whole thing to fall apart. So um, I think that will help both Pelosi and Schumer get something passed. Um, but my suspicion is that if this is going to work out, you're not going to see the House pass something wildly different than what Biden proposed. It'll be like the rescue plan. It'll have to go in a sort of similar fashion where the House passes something very in line with what he proposed. The Senate passes something very similar to that. And then the House takes what the Senate passes. I think that there's not a whole lot of wiggle room to get creative with this and do, you know, two wildly different bills, a conference committee, um, because, you know, any big changes spoil the coalition uh, in one chamber or the other. So you, the, the, they have to move uh, on very, very similar tracks. Well, pressure's on Chuck Schumer. Um, when I saw him today, he didn't seem like you know, he was under any stress at all. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it is fascinating, though, um, like the the magnitude of the opportunity. I mean, the, like a lot of things that people have wanted for years are on the table. It's kind of amazing. Here's the other thing, though, is, is when you have a 50-vote uh, Senate majority. I don't want to be like grim or whatever, but like Elsie Hastings passed away this past week. That brought the House majority from I think 222 to 221 or something like that. Um, but if it had been a, a 218, 217 House, suddenly it would be a 217, 217 House or whatever. You see, you, you see where I'm going with this is that Chuck Schumer – can't be certain that he's going to wake up as majority leader tomorrow. Wow. Things, ha things happen wow. in life. I mean, they happened in 2009. That's two so Democrats, macabre right? of you, Brian. No, well, but, <laughs> but, 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 but if, if you really think passing this thing is, is necessary for the country, key for the Democratic Party's viability for Joe Biden's legacy, speed is of the, issue, uh, is of the essence because you, you – you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so you, it, time is not really a luxury. I agree with this sentiment. I like where you're at, Brian. You're like full steam ahead. Like, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> stop trying. Like, don't predict the future. Don't don't assume that your 50 votes is going to be with you from here to the end of the Congress. Great Use advice. it while you have it because you, you don't know when you're going to wake up and it's going to be gone. Um, and, you know, I, I think that a lot of people who work in politics come to think of themselves as being – invincible and can't see, can't imagine the world carrying on without them. And so, this is not natural for them to think that their own vulnerabilities as humans might get in the way of historically important things happening. Um, but it it can. And I mean, it did uh, when Barack Obama was president, right? Uh, Ted Kennedy passed away. There was a special election to fill his seat and Democrats lost that seat. With it, they lost their 60-vote majority. And who knows what world we'd be living in today if that hadn't happened. You're a, you're a highly logical man, Brian. I really <laughs> enjoy talking to you about this stuff. I'm going to coin a term for you. You can feel free to use it if you like it. Political physicist. All right. I like it. Brian Boyler is a political <laughs> physicist. And then you can just – because you just give such logical analyses uh, of each of these issues. Uh, and I love it. You know, I, I can see why you have such – frankly, incredible responsibility helping shape the, the views of millions. Um, so the 100 days is starting to actually wrap up, which is crazy. You know, I can't, I mean, thank goodness, like, you know, thank goodness Joe's president. Thank goodness things are going well. I will say that I am very much enjoying the Biden administration. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm super It's been it. a nice surprise, right? A bit of a relief. Yeah, go Joe. Really, I, you know, <laughs> and I spent a lot of time with Joe on the trail. For whatever reason, Joe and I were booked back to back in probably a dozen uh, events in Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, which, which is interesting because Joe's obviously a headliner and I was generally not the headliner. But for whatever reason, I was next to him a lot, spent a lot of time together backstage. He was always incredible to me, um, even when, frankly, there was like zero uh, evident political upside in being uh, really gracious to me, you know, like very early on. Like he was one of the, actually the first major candidates to be genuinely warm and friendly and human t towards me. It's one reason why he is who he is, frankly. And so one reason he's president, he's just like a, he's a good guy. So I, I always really enjoyed spending time with Joe on the trail. Um, I think his administration has been a pleasant surprise for um, a, a lot of folks. And so now that his hundred days are almost over, 
are you going to then start a new podcast about his next hundred days? And are you going to, and like, what do you project for the, the next stage? Um, so I don't know what we're going to do. If, uh, will there be a Rubicon season three or a rebranding of the show? Or I don't even really know what my numbers are. So it's possible they'll be like, you're done podcasting, Brian. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, not to spoil what we're working towards in the finale, but like the premise of the show is 100 days is just kind of a made up benchmark. There's nothing special about that number. Um, there's something true about the idea that presidents can sort of make or break their presidencies early on. Um, if they come in prepared and do a lot of big stuff out the gate, it can set the stage for success. And if they don't do that, they can fail. And, you know, uh, the, the Trump administration was omni shambles, uh, from the get go, but it might have been a very different situation if they hadn't thrown out Chris Christie's transition playbook started from scratch after he won the election. You know, if, if, if there had been processes in place to do things in a considered way, his, he, you know, that he is might have so been, not the Trump administration. No, MO. of course not. Right? Like it's, <laughs> but, 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 like I, it, I don't think that it's hard to imagine a successful Trump administration. But I think that it became impossible to recover for him. That you know, the instant they made that call, like you can't, you can't uh, undo that. Um, and so the idea with the show is: is Biden going to? Not cement his legacy, although he might, who knows, but uh, is he going to create a foundation um, that can carry him to a, the end of a successful presidency in four or eight years? And I think that um, what what you're seeing is, is yes. There's one thing unique about this situation, which is like Barack Obama had uh, a, a successful 100 days too in, in some respects. Um, but at the end of those 100 days, I don't think it was – necessarily clear what had to happen for the next several thousand days uh, to cement his legacy. Like he wanted to pass the healthcare bill and he did. Um, but that was really a matter of like wrangling votes and was it going to take a few months or the better part of a year as it as it turned out to take. With with Biden, I think that what what's unique is that while he's laid this foundation, it can all kind of peter out because he doesn't have those huge majorities. And if he's going to continue implementing his agenda, um, he's going to need to convince Democrats to govern and, and change the Senate rules if that's required. So what you just said was essentially like, hey, we should get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, which by the mm -hmm. way, I totally agree with. It's a made up mm -hmm. rule. <laughs> they adopted it themselves. Yeah. You know, they can unadopt it. They, you know, there's no reason not to. So I just want to make clear that it sounds like you're in the same camp. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I have been since – when I was like a, a, a freshman journalist, like a like super green, I, I think Democrats were having a fight with Republicans over George W. Bush's judicial nominees. And my inclination was to be like, you know, we don't want those crazy people on the bench. But then I learned what what they were what what that meant in in practice was that Democrats were just kind of arbitrarily saying that you need sixty votes to pass stuff, and it made no sense to me. And I'm like, why why is this a rule? We're not going to like that if you know after eight years of George W. Bush, there's a lot to clean up, and and Republicans can just say, nah, that that requires sixty votes. So it's been a it's been a sixteen year process of me trying to shake people. Uh, you were ahead of the curve on this, Brian. You were anti filibuster before it was cool. Now it's the good. Rest it's, of us are here with you. It's also it's also good to you know because there's a lot of hypocrisy around political process, right? In general, uh, and it it buys you, I think, a little bit of credibility when under George W. Bush, you were saying the filibuster is a bad idea. Well done. Um, like like you're not you're not just saying it you're now not because just a one sidesism. I got it. You're <laughs> like you're, you're like look, this didn't make sense no matter who was in power, <laughs> which is true. It never did make sense. The jobs plan could pass theoretically without um, without changing the filibuster rules because of how the budget process works. Uh, but, you know, all around the country and state legislatures that don't have filibusters, Republicans are passing bills to disenfranchise people. And the only cure for that is for federal legislators to pass legislation to protect their rights. Please. And, and, and you cannot put a bill reestablishing the Voting Rights Act or 
creating statehood for people like me if the filibuster's in place. It just it will not happen. Both Biden but also his allies in Congress need to ask themselves, do we want this to be the high water mark and then for the water level to fall to a very low level, it'll be a real quiet place around Congress. Uh, there will have been this crush of activity at the outset of his administration and then for the next three years and nine months, it's going to be not much. Um, I, I, I That is so clear to me that that could happen, um, that it's hard to, to say, you know, yes, like his first 100 days have been a success. They've laid a great foundation for future success. But there is a thing that's unaddressed that could spoil it all. And we don't know how that story is going to end. So maybe wow. that's season three of Rubicon right there. <laughs> maybe. No, the, the powerful message I got from you just then, Brian, which I completely agree with, and you could apply it to a lot of things in your life is keep going. Keep going, Democrats. You've got a few successes on your belt. I really want a big one, but it's cool. It was so big, we'll count it as several. Just keep going. <laughs> Just keep, <Yeah. laughs> like, keep trying to get some more wins under your belt. Yep. Uh, so, Brian, if someone enjoyed this conversation, which I did immensely, and they want to hear more about your perspective on what's going on, which I find profoundly uh rational and edifying how can they best find you and keep up with you the podcast is rubicon but it sounds like that might be the season might be ending uh is it to, to follow crooked media you directly uh i i will take i will take the personal follows directly uh, i i tweet at brian boiler um i have a weekly newsletter called big tent um i also edit our nightly newsletter which is called what a day um I write articles and publish articles by others at crooked.com. And obviously, our, our, if you go to crooked.com and click the podcast button, our company now has, I don't know, a dozen or something uh, uh, podcasts. Obviously, the flagship is Pod Save America, but there's so many good shows on there. Um, I would encourage people to go and just pick ones on topics that you like, like – you're not obligated to listen to everyone. I'm not even sure that would be would be possible. But definitely do the other stuff, the Twitter and newsletter stuff and 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 the articles. Do that first. Reading is better than listening. Amen. Have you written a book that I missed? I haven't. I've I've, you know, I've started and junked a number of proposals because um part of it's um self-doubt, but a lot of it is just that, you know. A lot of people write books and then they're, they're on the shelves for a couple months. Maybe they get a few good reviews. They sell a few thousand copies, but then they're kind of forgotten because they're about a specific thing at a specific moment in time. Uh, and it's rare for somebody who's a political journalist to write a book that's that um, stands the test of time. Um, and I would feel frustrated by spending a year or two on a book that was relevant for a couple months. So, I've been trying to uh, home in on any uh, – a couple of ideas, but any idea that I think is sort of bigger than the, the news, um, because the news comes and goes. Um, so I, I, I and intend to write a book. I want to have written a book in the same way I kind of want to have run a marathon. Um, I'm just not sure what it'll be about or when, but um, I will keep you posted. Hey, I'll even like message you with ideas, and maybe you can help me uh, shape them a little bit. I, well, I, I let me just say that uh, I would be among the first in line if you did write a book, Brian. I think you've got an incredible point of view that the country and the world needs. So count me among those pushing you to say, you know, I really think you you should uh, take some of your perspective and ideas, and I think you've got. A lot, a lot to offer. Brian, <laughs> thank you for everything you do and help keep us heading in a better direction, brother. Appreciate the heck out of you and congrats on the incredible uh, role you have. I mean, it, it really is a, a, like an awesome organization uh, that reaches, I think, tens of millions of people every day. So congrats, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brian. Follow this man. 